Hi, Franco Cavallari coming to you today for another session of Potential Within. We're going to talk about dietary protein, biological value of different protein sources, and what that means to general health, the maintenance of lean body mass, and um, we're going to talk about plant-based proteins versus animal-based proteins and other means to enhance the biological value and the anabolic response to that food that you're consuming, in particular the protein intake. So, you know, there's this massive trend that we know about uh, towards consuming plant-based proteins for environmental reasons. And, um, you know, many people want to be um, choosing plant-based proteins not only because of environmental reasons, but because of you know, ethics and um, and how our um, commercialized agriculture has created uh, an environment for these animals that's just intolerable. And yeah, I can see where there's a problem. However, I'm going to talk about scientific facts today outside the scope of emotion and how these facts relate to biological health. I have to tell you, when I was younger and I was competing and I was looking to build significant lean body mass, muscle mass, uh, as a bodybuilder. Uh, as you know, I, I, I competed right through my undergrad years up until uh, graduating with my Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition and um, Biochemistry from the University of British Columbia. Uh, that before my post-graduate um, work in my, my PhD work in the Faculty of Medicine. However, uh, during that time, from first year university to fourth year, I, I competed to win several bodybuilding contests. Mr. Vancouver, Mr. British Columbia, Western Canada, and so on, eventually winning Mr. North America, the IFBB, Mr. North American Championships in Los Angeles, Redondo Beach. And um, everything in my life was pointed at two things, academics to get my grades and bodybuilding. And that's all I did. I slept. I ate and I lived and I breathed bodybuilding and I studied intensely the chemistry and the mechanism of anabolism and I have to tell you at that time there was no controversy but times today I and mean, that time was a long time ago 1990s early 90s um, uh, there was no controversy animal protein had a much higher biological value than plant proteins did. And that persists today. That hasn't changed. But what has changed is the passion and the intensity that people present um, about the ethics of animal proteins. So let's um, talk a little bit about you know, um, what is in this book. This book, Potential Within, was designed, um, and I wrote this uh, long after I graduated with my undergrad, as originally started out as a foundation for my PhD work and eventually went to 500 pages, 500 scientific references, speaking to not only my experiences but my research on biological performance and anti-aging which became more intensely studied as I aged myself and um, continue to study today. But a lot of this work then in 1990s um, has not has not really changed today in terms of the results. The scientific results in the day or biological value of the protein source was the measuring stick for the quality of the protein that we consumed. And I'll talk about quantity versus quality in a moment. Um, today, the research is showing the same thing. Animal proteins have a much higher biological value than these plant-based proteins. Um, many reasons for that. It's not just the amino acid profile. So in this book, I actually do have a list of protein sources with their biological value and dietary programs based on your goals, whether it's endurance sport, bodybuilding, uh, muscle building, um, powerlifting, and, and just simply staying fit and healthy. Um, and I talk about the amount of protein, the proportion of the macronutrients required based on your activity and the demand you create. And um, I'm not going to talk a lot about 
the broad spectrum of those macronutrients, but today I'm going to talk about protein. And biological value is a measure of how much nitrogen you take in in that protein source. Now, amino acids in your protein have an amine group, a nitrogen, that is tangible and consistent within that protein. And there are formulas that uh, we can use to actually take the nitrogen uh, in that protein source and calculate exactly how many grams of protein are in that protein source from the nitrogen itself. So we can actually measure the nitrogen you consume versus the nitrogen you excrete in urine and in fecal matter. And then the uh, net result of that would be what you retain in the body. And that nitrogen retention is essentially reflective of how well your body in that moment, because there's a lot of different conditions and environmental and lifestyle um, conditions that affect how your body utilizes protein as well. But in that moment, it measures this biological value, the amount of nitrogen you've taken in versus the amount of nitrogen you've lost from that protein source. And we can, re, we, we can actually calculate the biological value based on that nitrogen that your body retained. And then we quantify what that value is for each protein source. So, you know, for example, red meat, and I haven't seen this list for, gosh, a long time, but um, I've worked with it so intensely. That's rough. It's memorized. Um, you know, fish is roughly 82, 83. Um, uh, beef is around 83, uh, 84. Chicken is about 80. Uh, soy protein is one of the only protein sources that actually has a, a significantly higher biological value than most uh, vegetable-based or plant-based proteins, and that has a, a biological value of about 74, 75. Now, eggs, whole eggs, have a biological value of 100. That 100 was established as a standard, and so for the longest time, nothing ever exceeded egg as a standard of 100. Everything was measured against whole egg, and every source that was measured was lower than whole egg, and this is why whole eggs supply such good quality protein. Whereas egg whites, the protein biological value is slightly lower than whole egg. It's somewhere around 90. Milk protein, somewhere around 90. And then one day, there came along whey. Whey protein. Whey protein is different from the casein fraction in milk. And whey protein started to register in and around 100 and over 100 in the biological value which was unforeseen. And this is one of the reasons why bodybuilders and power athletes began to, to utilize whey as the source of protein to build muscle because the nitrogen retention potential in that whey was much higher than most other supplement sources, higher than casein, which is about 80, um, and, and, and then higher than egg whites. And in some cases, if you have a good quality whey protein, higher than egg even. So throughout my life in bodybuilding uh, and throughout my life today, as a 58-year-old staying pretty darn fit with a six-pack still, I use whey protein at least twice a day to pad my protein intake for the day. And we're going to talk about daily quantities in a moment and why they should be so high even as you age. So for the longest time, the research historically has shown, and today, today research is as late as even a year ago has shown, that consuming one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day was what you needed if you were working out intensely to build muscle power and or were an athlete who was working extensively towards some elite goals. Anything less than that one gram could be considered a compromising factor in your potential and your performance. And there, are, there, there is research today that also shows that as much as 1.5 grams of protein per pound of body weight per day can produce even incremental results. And I 
don't necessarily agree that that high a protein intake is required. Uh, it may be required if your other macronutrients like fat and carbohydrate intake are compromised at the same time. So why are these animal proteins higher in biological value than the plant-based protein? And it's, the answer is actually uh, quite simple. And one is that the amino acid profile of these animal proteins more closely serves the amino acid demands that we need to build tissue. And you see, what you have to keep in mind is if you eat a protein source that is limited in amino acids that are essential, so all of the essential amino acids that your body needs, and essential versus non-essential, what this means is the essential amino acids your body cannot make. So it needs it from the diet. The non-essential amino acids, the body can make from the essential amino acids, so they are non-essential. So these higher biological value proteins from animal sources tend to have more of a complete source of the essential amino acids that your body cannot make. But there's more to it. These animal sources also tend to supply a significant Leucine. And this is one of the reasons why whey protein performs better than most other protein sources because two things that it delivers when it delivers a protein source. One, a very high concentration of the essential amino acids that your body requires to make protein. Essential amino acids it cannot make. But two, a very high concentration or load of leucine. It's a specific amino acid that actually acts as a signaling mechanism for anabolism. And this signaling mechanism is it, it quite, quite interesting. We have an enzyme called mTOR that is highly sensitive to the nutrient intake that we consume through various other sensors, like AMPK and others. These are kinases. These are signaling mechanisms within our cells that do unique things that we study intensely here at our lab. And so when leucine levels are high in the diet, mTOR is sensitized. However, once this research disclosed how important leucine was to anabolism, to activating anabolism um, at a cellular level, meaning activating the uh, protein synthesis for the rebuilding process of protein after you break it down in resistance training, People started <clears throat> supplementing with leucine to heighten the amount of leucine in their diet. And supplementing leucine beyond a threshold, and it's the threshold seems to be what is supplied in a whey protein serving of 30 grams of protein. It has roughly about 2.5 grams to 3 grams, or 3,000 milligrams, just under 3,000 milligrams of leucine. That seems to be the sweet spot for leucine's activation potential of protein synthesis. And so the cool thing is that whey protein seems to kind of fit the bill where leucine levels for most whey protein doses or serving sizes of 30 grams of protein deliver approximately just under three grams of leucine plus the array of essential amino acids that are required for rebuilding tissue. Both those things need to be in place at the same time for anabolism to be restored, um, uh, generated. So why does this happen? It's because the body's saying, hey, look, I need to make sure that the resources are there before I turn on energy-consuming processes that use up resources, like the amino acids of protein, to rebuild your tissues. And if they're not there at full capacity, every time I need to rebuild, I'm not building I'm not wasting my time or energy. And that's why bodybuilders, powerlifters, uh, elite athletes learn very quickly that consuming protein frequently throughout the day helps support this anabolic effect. And then you've got experts over time saying, well, wait a minute, you don't really need to supply protein that frequently. You don't really need to supply high biological value protein. And you know what? Those experts are not resounding science-based information. There might be isolated research out there, but the majority of the research is showing 
that these high biological value proteins are maintaining that mTOR and other anabolic activations in place so that you can build long-term and build healthy. Now, as we age, and again, you know, I kind of relate my own research to my own evolution in life. Um, as we age, things start to change. Things start to change. Now, whether the anabolic activity that occurs to rebuild muscle is a function or related to insulin sensitivity is not really 100% known because as insulin sensitivity declines, so does anabolic potential or protein synthesis. And so the question we've had as researchers is, you know, is there a direct link between a decline in insulin sensitivity as we age and then the sensitivity of the anabolic switch that turns on protein synthesis? Because as we age, there seems to be a desensitization to that, in that switch to our protein intake and exercise. So we need exercise, putting load on the muscle that forces the muscle to cope and then turn on its anabolic activity to rebuild muscle. But we also need <clears throat> those amino acids, those essential amino acids present at the same time with leucine to heighten the effects of that switch and the sensitization. But as we age, all that decreases. So what has to happen as we age is we need to maintain the amount of protein that we need to consume to, to restore and rebuild lean muscle. Because if you don't, you start to uh, lose muscle mass with age. It's called sarcopenia. It's a natural process. And the sarcopenia begins to develop in all of us and create vulner vulnerability to illness. As you lose muscle mass, you become more vulnerable to illness. Your ability to recover from serious illness declines. And so it's very important that through exercise, resistance training, we continue to stimulate muscle to, to at the very least, be maintained as we age. But somehow to make sure that that, that anabolic sensor, the stimulus for mTOR, which is typically leucine and the rest of the amino acids in a good quality protein source. Again, whey has a very high leucine content and the essential amino acids. And you know, beef is always tooted as a protein that beefs you up. Why? Well, beef is another protein source that has a very high leucine content and all of the essential amino acids you need in the protein source. But beef has another thing red meat that other protein sources don't necessarily carry with it, and that's creatine. And that's why you see a lot of these carnivores claiming that their performance goes up um, and their, life's, their life and, and, and health has improved when they switch to utilizing beef or the carnivore diet. Two things are happening there. They're reducing their, their processed carbohydrate intake, which improves insulin function and general metabolic health but increasing the amount of protein they're consuming that has leucine in it, creatine in it, and all of the essential amino acids to serve the body. And that's why you start to see improvements in health, especially, that will happen especially if you're starting to evolve towards metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance as you age. Now, as I've done throughout my life, I begin to research things I need in our lab and in the field in third-party peer-reviewed journals to see what I need as I age to continue to maintain muscle. Not because I'm egotistical and need to maintain size. I have these shirts we call, uh, that, that everybody seems to love these days, called Size Matters, it says on front. It matters because the muscle mass protects you from morbidity and mortality. And this is why it's important as you age to make sure that anabolic sensor stay, stays sensitized to your dietary intake of protein. And the way to do that is to maintain physical activity so that that muscle mass is stimulated to be maintained, the protein synthesis to be activated, and to maintain a high quality protein source that the body can utilize 
and recognize as an mTOR activator so that that skeletal muscle can be restored. And that means, I'm going back to repeat again, a protein source that contains significant leucine for serving and all of the essential amino acids every time. Now the leucine content in plant-based proteins is not high. It's not high. And the completeness of the amino acids that are essential in those plant-based proteins is not usually complete. There's limiting factors. Now, one way that you get around that with these plant-based proteins is to combine the different types of proteins. Legumes with cereals are actually complementary to deliver to each other the amino acids that might be limiting in the other to then create more complete protein for your body to utilize. But even with that, the biological value cannot reach that which you would have with beef, fish, and a good quality whey protein or whole egg. You know, I eat a couple of whole eggs, if not three, every morning. And I have half a whey protein serving before my workout in the morning, or in the evening if I do my workout in the evening, and a full whey protein serving after my workout. I talked about bracketing, bracketing your workout with a good quality protein source. Half a serving before the workout of whey protein, that's 15 grams of protein, and 35 to 40 grams of protein after the workout, whey. Now, here's some more interesting research to add to your whey and beef up its, its contribution to anabolism. Research has shown irrefutably that the addition of extra virgin olive oil to that whey, to your diet daily, improves anabolism and improves leanness. Why? The monounsaturated fats have been shown to support insulin function and reduce the rate of insulin resistance. But somehow, and the mechanism isn't really understood, also sensitize that anabolic sensor, mTOR, and improve the body's response and sensitization to leucine and the amino acids in the protein. So as we, when we're young, we may not need that enhancement by the olive oil in the whey protein shake. So I'll take a half a whey protein shake before I work out and half a tablespoon roughly of olive oil in it and half a tablespoon of fish oil, EPA and DHA, that goes a pentanoic acid and that goes a hexanoic acid. Now, there's research showing irrefutably that the EPA DHA supplementation improves sensitivity to the leucine and amino acids of that anabolic sensor as well, in addition to sensitization that's that's created by the olive oil and it might sound pretty rudimentary and absurd but the research is there and so I've been doing this all my life and in fact even with my children essential fatty acids such as flaxseed oil supplies but the conditionally essential fatty acids such as those in fish oils daily in the whey protein shake now it is not really clearly understood what the mechanism of these omega-3 fatty acids in the fish oil are that actually contribute to this improved anabolism. But something I've studied, because in my doctoral work, my, my work was entirely focused on NF-kappa-B signaling, which was inflammatory response. And I worked on, on this, in fact, actually for about eight years. Uh, five years first, and then two years off, and then another three years afterwards to finish my doctorate and it was all on NF-kappa B signaling and in relation to various compounds, natural compounds that would have helped to mitigate exacerbated response to inflammatory cascades. So there's a lot of work that indicates that it's the inflammatory response to physical work when dysregulated or not regulated properly can interfere with the anabolic response for recovery of that muscle. 
So whether you're a bodybuilder or just someone working a laborious job, to improve on controlling the inflammation caused by the physical work um, improves on the body's ability to recover. And the way we do that naturally is to supply the body with enough omega-3 fatty acids that are your cell membranes are sustained by those fatty acids and the, the inflammatory response to the physical work that you put in, on your body, the load you put on your body, is never exacerbated. It's short-lived. And therefore, the body is allowed to recover and use the amino acids, the protein that you're consuming, in, again, the high biological value protein you're consuming, to restore and rebuild. I got to tell you, I'm coming on 68, or sorry, 58. I'm going to be uh, 59 in June. And um, I, I regularly, you know, post pictures of me working out and yeah, my shirt's off sometimes. And people are like, come on, what do you do? I'm showcasing the fact that, look, we need to keep muscle mass and f fat mass in the context of health. And if you don't, you're not going to be able to resist illness. It's that simple. And at my age, yeah, I train, work out in the gym, 45 minutes to an hour each time, probably about six days a week, and it's part of my lifestyle. It's like eating breakfast, like eating lunch, like eating dinner, but it's stimulating the body's capacity to maintain lean body mass and maintain the tissues throughout the body. I talked about myokines. I did another post a while ago about myokines, muscle chemicals. We'll look at that. I also have a post on cholesterol. So don't worry about eating eggs as your protein source. You don't have to worry about the cholesterol in the diet because 10% or less of that ends up circulating in your body. People who have cholesterol problems, it comes from, usually from a metabolic problem, usually because you're eating high glycemic index carbohydrates, trans fats, and they stimulate the production of cholesterol in the body. Nevertheless, there are some people that have uh, SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or other uh, factors metabolically that would contribute to elevated cholesterol, and maybe you have to watch how your body's making that cholesterol, but not the cholesterol in your diet, because the body will not absorb a lot of that cholesterol from the diet. Um, let's go back to protein and talk about maintaining the omega-3 fatty acid load in your diet throughout the day, and extra virgin olive oil at least three times a day, two tablespoons a day. Yeah, sounds like 200 calories extra a day in oils or maybe more, but it's going to help your metabolism keep you leaner. It's counterintuitive, but it's going to help you stay leaner because it supports insulin function, supports glucose management, supports the brain, and supports the anabolic effect of your protein source you're consuming. Now, I want to circle back again uh, to talk about the total protein throughout the day. Because I said, if you want to stay healthy as an athlete, one gram of protein per pound of body weight per day. So if you weigh 150 pounds, that means 150 grams of protein a day. 150 grams a day. That's about 40 grams per meal. 40 grams per meal. So four meals is 160 grams, three meals 120 grams. So to put it in perspective, one egg has roughly six to seven grams of protein. One serving of whey protein will have 30 to 40 grams of protein. Okay, So it's not easy to get all of your protein needs from food, but if you can, great. The problem is that as you age, trying to get that protein intake for the day from food ends up coming with a tax. The tax being calories that come with that food. And so if you can get 100 grams of protein from food throughout the day and then have two protein drinks from whey, which is 100 calories per protein drink, you're going to probably hit your requirements. Now, people who are completely sedentary can probably get away with consuming 100 grams of protein a day and not needing the 150 if you weigh 150. Okay? So that's the kind of uh, protein intake we're talking about. But as you age, the quality of that protein needs to be considered. The biological value needs to be high in order to trigger that anabolic potential, that protein synthesis to maintain the muscle. And if you don't 
as you age, it's going to be harder to maintain the muscle and easier to put on fat. Adding to each of your whey protein drinks that will augment your diet, that will add to your protein throughout the day, you add one tablespoon of olive oil and one teaspoon to one tablespoon of fish oil. With, um, I have one that has a, a, a lemon flavor to it so that it's not as fishy. And in a vanilla whey protein, it gives it a creamy, lemony flavor. It doesn't have to taste great. Hey, listen, your shakes don't have to take like McDonald's milkshakes. Okay? These are protein drinks that I put in water to keep them lean. And it'll have one scoop of whey protein in water, one tablespoon of olive oil, one tablespoon almost of fish oil, and that's what I consume twice a day, sometimes three times a day, usually two and a half times a day. And that half is my pre-workout protein because I bracket the workout with the protein to protect the muscle from the catabolism that could otherwise take place when you're training. So I talk about this protein with intense focus because it's important, especially as you age, to maintain a good quality protein source. And there's tons of research showing that it does improve and support lean body mass, reduce fat mass, and improve general insulin function. Because a lot of these plant-based proteins, um, when you have the simulated plant-based meats that are made from, they often have seed oils and other things added to them that increase the amount of carbohydrate that are in that protein. So you're not really getting a good quality high and um, purified protein source that way. If you're going to use plant-based proteins, make sure you're combining the legumes with the cereals so that you're, uh, you're getting um, a better quality protein that has synergy and complementary amino acid uh, delivery. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to add a bit of creatine to that uh, plant-based protein source and, you guessed it, leucine because that will help to that will facilitate and support the biological value and turn on that anabolic activity. So now, there's a question that people often ask, and that's uh, people who have kidney stone problems and relating that to a high protein intake, and that's usually not. Uh, there's, there's much more to the metabolic state that contributes to kidney stone uh, generation. You know, meats that might have high purine levels will result in higher uric acid. I mean, that's more related to gout. And so the organ meats might be something you want to avoid if you have a vulnerability there. Uh, sardines, mackerel, they tend to be high in purines. But there are other types of kidney stones, like calcium oxalate, uh, struvite. These are different types that have different compositions. Um, and I got to tell you, the best kept secret for dissolving kidney stones. If you have a kidney stone problem, this is going to be your salvation. Potassium citrate. And I take potassium citrate daily, not because I, I've only had one kidney stone in my life, and i got to tell you, I do not ever want to have a kidney stone again. It knocked me to the ground. It's painful. And I don't know if it was because of high protein intake. I doubt it was because I've been consuming a one to two grams of protein per body weight, uh, per pound of body weight per day for since I was 15 or 14 years of age. Um, but potassium citrate not only helps to remove excess water and edema, uh, potassium citrate also helps to alkalinize the urine so that uric acid crystals and calcium oxalate crystals dissolve. So if you do have kidney stones on a regular basis, use potassium citrate daily. That's a great preventive measure. If you have a kidney stone that's causing you pain, use a significant potassium citrate dose. Make sure you talk to your medical practitioner, your doctor, about the dose that you should take because taking too much potassium can be dangerous, especially if you're taking other heart medications that might affect potassium levels in the blood um, or diuretics and things like that. So, um, you know, taking the regular over-the-counter potassium citrate from a health food store and taking one or two 99-milligram uh, tablets shouldn't pose as a problem. But if you're going to be using it therapeutically to dissolve 
an existing kidney stone, then I'd be careful to talk to your uh, consult with a physician to determine what the dose should be so that you don't uh, cause any adverse events with other medications you might be taking. Nevertheless, um, potassium citrate is an amazing countermeasure for kidney stones. Um, if that's a concern with your protein intake, and it shouldn't be because it's not that common. Um, so this, in my opinion, really takes us to the end of the story with regards to protein. If you want more information on protein, I'm not trying to sell the book, it doesn't matter if you buy it or not, you can even call our office and we'll get you a copy of that uh, chart for biological value. And um, uh, I think that brings us to the end. If you have any questions, we don't mind receiving your emails. Uh, wishing you all the best.